Are you uh, working right now? Oh, there we go. I'm going to mute myself. Thank you. All right. Well, I thank uh, all of you who are here uh, eating pizza and also those of you that uh, joined in on Zoom. Uh, I'm going to uh, do my best to, to manage my time. Hopefully, we'll come in right about an hour here. And uh, uh, the solution is, uh, or this, not the solution, this uh, presentation is uh, uh, kind of a evolving topic. Uh, I think I first presented something similar to this uh, five or six years ago at the Wedge, actually. And uh, some of it's uh, related to um, best practices, uh, our experiences of, of uh, tools and techniques that work well for developing uh, systems and teams. And uh, I'm very interested in feedback uh, on uh, ways that other people have done things or parts of the things that worked for us that maybe haven't worked for you. Uh, I'd love to hear feedback on things like that. Uh, so uh, we'll just get rolling here. So uh, I'm an Oregon native uh, and if my slide will advance, I'll try. There we go. Uh, so I've, I've lived there uh, pretty much my whole life and uh, with a few visits other places. Uh, my professional background uh, was in IT. I worked uh, uh, managing uh, systems uh, and servers and uh, developing uh, in-house uh, custom solutions. Uh, many years uh, as a Unix Solaris admin and then later doing FileMaker development. Uh, so I've had a, uh, the benefit of having some exposure to a lot of different uh, systems and uh, platforms and business problems too. And uh, now I run a, a small consulting team called 3Prong and we do uh, custom development work uh, and, and uh, uh, performance uh, uh, improvements and things like that across uh, several different industries. So uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, pro I needed to find a problem that I was solving here, so I came up with some challenges that that this uh, these topics should help with. And it's really kind of focused on uh, issues that come up as systems grow. Uh, so uh, I think we all uh, either have built systems that have grown and uh, run into challenges as they grow, or we've walked into uh, somewhere where uh, a company has uh, seen success or organization has grown, and then they uh, run into struggles. Um, that, uh, you know, sometimes those get blamed on uh, the platform or technology, but uh, in almost every situation, it's just a uh, misunderstanding of uh, what's needed uh, to address the problem. Uh, because things that work well to solve uh, solutions at small scale don't necessarily keep working uh, at a larger scale. And so when are, when are those situations and what sort of approaches can we use to, uh, to uh, either avoid uh, running into those problems before they happen or maybe uh, address some of those things uh, when they when they have already happened. Uh, so I want to uh, do my best to introduce um, some topics that would normally be discussed in sort of like a computer science uh, uh, venue that are uh, sort of uh, tested and, and mature ideas that have a lot of traction and are used in lots of different industries and then see uh, we can talk about practical ways that those could be applied inside of FileMaker. So the first one I'm going to uh, jump into is uh, separation of concerns. And uh, uh, I probably should have just listed uh, Wikipedia as quoted for every single slide here, but a lot of this <laughs> information is widely available and uh, uh, pretty, uh, pretty well documented. Uh, but separating concerns is really a uh, sort of this idea of uh, compartmentalizing problems, taking, taking uh, bigger pro big problems and breaking them down into smaller problems, uh, focusing on that one thing that you need to solve, doing it well. Uh, and then if you have another problem, maybe addressing it separately um, uh, or sometimes even uh, breaking up the work to, to divide the uh, effort so that uh, multiple people can contribute. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a known drawback with uh, with delegation and adding extra people and and uh, things like that, and that you you do create overhead. So uh, if you uh, leverage 
uh, separation of concerns, you are going to end up with more code than if you uh, if you didn't apply this principle. Um, and that's that's a trade off worth keeping in mind. So here's sort of a practical look of uh, you know applying this idea inside of FileMaker. Uh, we've all either written or been asked to fix someone's uh, monolithic script, uh, a script that's just way longer than it should be. Um, and so, you know, here's here's a simple situation where we might have a uh, a script that does uh, multiple things uh, that's part of a, of a larger task that's the requirement, uh, but we can identify and pull out uh, modules or components that uh, are really sort of freestanding tasks that can be done by themselves, tested by themselves, and maybe reused. Um, and uh, part of the point I was trying to make here is not just identifying and separating the things, but also recognizing that the total amount of code after you've separated it into modules is gonna be more. Uh, because there's overhead to pass the information and state and things like that uh, between each of those modules that you wouldn't have uh, in a monolithic situation. So, uh, you know, there's going to be diminishing returns as you, uh, if you break things smaller and smaller at some point, uh, the overhead you're adding to break something up is going to be not, not worth uh, the, the transition. So, you know, probably the best way to uh, Think about this as, as, you're, as you're having to scroll farther and farther down the script, you should have an aching feeling in your gut that like something in here needs to be uh, split out, right? Um, and uh, one place that I was really impressed uh, where uh, I've seen this done really well is in uh, automated um, uh, uh, code management and uh, develop uh, automated deploy, uh, development platforms where they are checking code into a system that then automatically runs tests against their like GitHub repository, things like that. And one of the things that I thought was really cool is uh, uh, one company I was visiting explained how their uh, code gets automatically graded against their own quality standards. So they set naming conventions and, uh, and uh, standards for using global variables, things like that, that are all part of their spec and they put a quality grade on every uh, file and every function that gets checked into the repository automatically. And if your script is too long, if it's not within their sweet spot of the, the um, uh, desired length, then you'll actually get credits against uh, your score. And any developer that checks in code that scores low enough automatically gets a bug ticket assigned to them. Uh, and their code is rejected. They're not allowed to check in code if it doesn't uh, score high enough. So. Uh, you know, I think there are opportunities to eventually do some things like this in FileMaker, but I just thought it was an interesting uh, idea to just uh, set an actual number as a company or, or, or a team of, uh, you know, what you uh, maybe a threshold. You don't ever want your scripts to be over a certain length uh, as an indicator that there might be a problem there. Uh, another place uh, that we could apply the idea of separation of concerns is in, um, in the relationship graph. And uh, uh, you will see uh, me promoting and advocating for anchor buoy in 99.999% of the time. Uh, and uh, you know, I really do need a good shaming picture of a terrible uh, graph mess here to put on my left-hand side. I didn't get one of those in there, but uh, I think we've all uh, run into some of those. Um, but, you know, the idea of separation of concerns here is, is really, uh, you know, having these gaps, this white space between what we call table occurrence groups. And each group, you can sort of comprehend it uh, because it's a smaller group. There's performance benefits uh, of not having everything interconnected. Um, and it allows you to focus on a smaller problem, uh, which is, you know, the anchor of your layout, really, in, in the case of FileMaker. Um, and, uh, I'm big on naming conventions too, but I'm not going to have time to cover that tonight too. But uh, I think that's a part, that's not really part of separation of concerns. Uh, the next thing I was going to talk about is coupling. Uh, this is something that I talked about five or six years ago when I first presented this and it hasn't really changed at all. So I reused some of the content there, but um, uh, uh, the uh, muscular skeletal system is a great example of, uh, of uh, a tightly coupled system. So it has all these principles of things that are uh, 
it makes replacing a module hard. You can't, you know, detach your hand, run a unit test on it, and then reattach it uh, without a lot of problems, right? So um, uh, there are a lot of things that work great about a tightly coupled system. There's uh, often opportunities for great efficiency. Um, there's a lot of um, ideas that things need to be in balance. You know, if you have a uh, a muscle or tendon that uh, separates or is too short or something, then you're going to have uh, problems where things don't work as well. So there's a lot of uh, things that have to work together uh, for it to work well. On the other end of the spectrum is this idea of a loosely coupled system. Uh, and so the example here is sort of like a, a common uh, 15 amp outlet here in the US. And, uh, and then we can see a device that would plug into that. Uh, so here we have uh, uh, something where we de define a spec or a way to interface between two different things. And uh, we have certain things that we agree to deliver as a minimum requirements in our spec. Uh, and then we attach other things to it that utilize some of those features, right? So there's a, there is a no longer balance necessarily between the, the producers, consumers, things like that. Uh, so that gives us opportunity to like plug something else in that uses different capabilities and features of the same uh, system. Uh, not only can we um, talk about how we change the uh, consumers, or like in the case of an appliance we're plugging in, but we can also change the other side of the interface in an imbalanced or a loosely coupled system, uh, such as uh, trading out a 15 amp uh, outlet for a 20 amp outlet. So we have these ideas of like uh, backwards compatibility, things like that can happen easier in a loosely coupled system. Uh, and there are, there are drawbacks too here. Um, and uh, some of those things really have to do with uh, uh, some inefficiencies or waste. You know, if you, uh, if you build a house and you wire every single plug for, for 20 amps and put 20 amp receptacles in and then never use a 20 amp appliance, you've overbuilt, uh, you know, so there's some waste there. Um, so those are things to keep in mind, um, but uh, yeah, so how could we apply some of this in FileMaker? Um, I think a lot, one of the things that's uh, key to understand is how com context sort of uh, often guides us into this idea of, uh, or it's easy to make things that are tightly coupled because a lot of our scripts, uh, especially early on, start out as a way of sort of automating uh, something that a human would be doing in the interface. And, uh, if you automate something and then you change the context or the found set or you switch to a different window, then all of a sudden that thing breaks because it was coupled to that uh, context that you were expecting to do the automation in. Um, so it's kind of real easy to end up in a, in a tightly coupled situation. Uh, I should go through and make some new slides with the new version of FileMaker, but the, the ideas are still the same. Uh, you know, we could have these multiple contexts going on and each one of them contains state and information, things are set up a certain way. And the way that we would automate or script things is not necessarily gonna universally work between uh, different contexts unless we make an effort to do that. Uh, let's see, is there anything else we need to touch on here? Yeah, I think that's good. So uh, the next sort of topic I was gonna talk about, and a lot of these dovetail together. So they, they're discrete ideas, but a lot of them do have some overlap. Uh, and that is defensive programming. Uh, so uh, defensive design or, or things, that it's actually a, a common concept that applies to other industries than just programming. But uh, a good example is just thinking about defensive driving um, that you might uh, try to teach your student driver or something about um, uh, you know, needing to be prepared that you have all these other vehicles around you. And for the last five minutes, everyone's been acting sane and then you should really expect someone produce a, to do something insane right in front of you uh, at any moment right so you you uh, make strategies to prepare for that uh, and then you might also have situations where you, there's actually uh, uh, a hostile party um, where you need to prepare uh, for someone that's that's actually intentionally going to uh, come after you and then there could just be situations that are ourselves uh, sometimes we are our own worst enemy where we're writing code that's defective, uh, uh, either from inexperience or just uh, drowsiness. Um, 
And so those bugs come back to bite us later and being defensive in the way that we uh, write code can help protect us uh, from things like that. So this slide here is just a straight lift from, uh, from Wikipedia. Um, and uh, they make some really good succinct points here. And the, the part I was really emphasizing is the last bullet here about um, you know, being prepared for, for unexpected inputs and user actions. Um, but sometimes those unexpected inputs are from our own scripts or other parts of the system, right? Uh, where we might have defects uh, or unexpected behaviors. All right, so some of the practical ways that uh, you might think about doing this in your scripts, um, a lot of it uh, starts out with sort of uh, this distrust. Um, I was gonna say trust, but verify, that doesn't really work here, but, uh, um, but really expecting that data that comes into your script parameters might not be what you would hope for. Uh, and if you're using any sort of other inputs, um, to your script or function that's coming from record data or anywhere else, those are all places that uh, might have data in a form that you didn't expect. Um, another one that uh, I try to avoid as best as I can is using evaluate unless, uh, unless I absolutely have to. And that's just because um, you're executing uh, someone else's code as soon as you run evaluate. And if you don't uh, completely control what's coming in there, uh, there's some risk, and that risk is really amplified if you have plugins, um, uh, because I Evaluate can often trigger uh, plugins to do things either to your file system or across the internet, which, um, yeah, you can uh, corner me sometime when uh, we meet at a DEF CON or, or an Engage conference um, sometime, and I'll show you a little proof of concept file I have uh, where I uh, collect data out of somebody's system and uh, phone home with it, email it uh, using uh, evaluation uh, injection. Uh, the other thing that uh, is a bug we often run into, uh, if you've ever iterated in a loop past 10, uh, you probably had data type mismatches where you're comparing a string and a number and you wonder why your loop doesn't exit at the right point because you're comparing uh, dissimilar data types. Um, so using the get as number or, or get as Boolean, uh, get as date, those types of functions to make sure that the data you're dealing with is in the format uh, that you need it to be in. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, yeah, and then, uh, you know, the, you can add a lot of error checking to your code. Uh, error checking costs time. Uh, you know, it's going to cost you uh, in development to add lots of error checking. Uh, but if you know things that should always be the case, the context should always be a certain way for the script to run. Uh, you know, if someone asks you to do something to a record and that record doesn't exist, you should probably stop. Um, or if you have business rules that you know are part of your, uh, that you need to uh, make sure you cover, uh, those could be in there too. And then I uh, wanted to make a point that the, the, there's some defensive benefits of using UUIDs for your primary key. Uh, and an example of that might be as if you write a script that's uh, supposed to um, uh, delete an invoice. And so someone calls your script and says, delete invoice ID 10. And then you uh, go to a record that has an ID of 10 and then you delete it. Like the, there's some chance of overlapping keys if you're using serial numbers, but with UUIDs, there's pretty much no chance of you having the wrong record if you're identifying things by UUIDs. Um, I mean, there's other ways to guard against that, but it's sort of a, a side effect that you can avoid overlap um, in, in various areas if you're using uh, those unique IDs. Anything before I keep going? Good so far? One question if you'd like to- Yeah, go for it. Uh, advantages of modular versus um, monolithic and uh, I think you covered some of it, but just the reinforcement. Yeah, I guess, um, the advantages of uh, modular, uh, I think a lot of it comes down, some of it is uh, is being able to test and find and isolate bugs. Oh, the question was, uh, you know, what are the advantages of uh, modular uh, scripts versus a monolithic script? And uh, I think a lot of that um, comes down to uh, being able to test and debug things. Are, it's much easier to do if you can do it in a smaller uh, 
uh, in a smaller unit, um, but also iterating uh, if you want to enhance a feature, uh, being able to make a new version of a small module that you know what it's expected to do, you can iterate, improve it, and make sure it still does that expected thing. Um, whereas making improvements to a monolithic script is often a lot more disruptive, uh, harder to harder to verify that uh, you aren't going to have unintended cons consequences. Yeah. All right. Uh, the next thing I was going to uh, park on just a little bit is this idea of capitalizing on strengths. And uh, I don't know how many of you have been asked through your employer or have, have personally uh, gone through the Strength Strengths Finder book. Um, it's a, a business um, business tool for assessing you know things that you're good at. And, and while I don't agree with everything that the authors do, I do think it's a, a valuable tool to um, to do personal assessments and and uh, take advantage of areas uh, that you are uh, strong in and and be aware of things that you have weaknesses in. And I think we should do the same thing with any kind of platform that we work on. Um, you know what are what are FileMaker's strengths? Um, or weaknesses and, um, and uh, make the best of the platform that we have uh, and accomplish problems effectively. Uh, so I just kind of made a sort of a generalization graph here of this sort of spectrum of, of programming environments. Um, on, on the low level end, we have assembly code and then we can kind of move uh, across the spectrum to things uh, like uh, uh, object oriented, like, like Swift or Objective-C uh, all the way up to interpreted scripting languages. And uh, generally the observation in most situations is that you get a little bit less performance as you get farther away from the, from the metal and you go more high level. Um, so there's some expectation that uh, performance can be decreased for you know, iterative tasks, uh, uh, things where you need to crunch a lot of data, things like that, that you would need to do in the runtime. Uh, but the, uh, you know, really the equation is flipped when we talk about uh, time to market. I mean, there's a reason that uh, PHP is hugely popular. There's a, there's a reason that Python is popular. There's, there's reasons that FileMaker really excel and it's because we can uh, develop things much faster than if we were, you know, looking up assembly codes and, and writing things that have to run on, on an embedded chip or something like that. Um, so there's definitely big advantages to that. And so, you know, we should look for opportunities to take it, take advantage of that uh, in the FileMaker space. Uh, this, is, this is not necessarily a low versus high level, but, uh, you know, this idea of time to retrieve a, a record out of your database if you have an index, really it's irrelevant, you know, how high or low you are. For the most part, uh, all systems are going to uh, perform very well if you're retrieving data out of an indexed table. Uh, and the opposite is true for unindexed. If you have a terrible database design and you're trying to search things that are not indexable, the performance is going to be really bad. And that's it's not magically better if you're writing C code uh, versus uh, FileMaker code. So, uh, you know, there's uniformly that's something that um, that we struggle with, but it's not something that yeah, other people don't. It's a common problem. Uh, the other thing I was going to uh, point out is, uh, especially now, as as almost all of our users are now WAN users with people working from home, uh, but also with uh, mobile devices, tablets, and things, um, time to fetch data across the WAN is universally the same for everyone. Uh, but I did put a carve in carve out in here for for sloppy uh, FileMaker solutions, and. Uh, and this is really because FileMaker makes it so easy to build layouts and just throw any data that might be useful to you uh, on the screen, uh, things that are multiple relationships away. Um, FileMaker's model is a just-in-time approach to retrieving data only when you're sure you need it. So um, that could result in lots of trips across the land uh, to retrieve data. So. Uh, really, if we uh, make an effort to be careful about what data we're retrieving and come up, uh, if it becomes important, we can use um, things like perform script on server and uh, virtualist techniques and things like that to get all the data in one trip uh, if it's a situation where it becomes necessary or, or uh, lean out some of those layouts if they need to be optimized for WAN. Are we not retrieving fields from, uh, from tables that are 
multiple relationships away from uh, what's presently on screen. Are you going to drink the code and show it for reference models? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, actually, I have another. Uh, I have a WAN, a WAN first talk that I did at, Dev, at uh, DevCon that you can find the recording of. We actually spent the whole time just talking about those trips across the WAN. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity for improvement on solutions in that situation. Uh, so uh, you know, if we if we're honest about things that uh, FileMaker is not as good at, uh, one thing is version control. We'd love to see improvements in that area. That's something that uh, we don't have. Uh, uh, high concurrency solutions where there's uh, just a lot of users accessing the same data, especially updating the same data. Uh, there's some platforms that are going to excel at that more than FileMaker. Uh, although we are seeing that improve uh, as they add more threading uh, capabilities to the server, we're going to see better performance uh, with high concurrency. Uh, we don't really have uh, native uh, data structures like you'd have in uh, some other languages, which um, uh, you know, the closest thing we have is sort of like repeating fields and variables. We can do arrays of data. Um, we can do JSON, but that's really sort of a encapsulate. It's still a string. It's not really a, a native data type. Um, so that's something that um, is a little bit of a detriment for us. Uh, and then one of the other ones that we often run into if we get into larger enterprise environments is we'd like to be able to have uh, development systems and then deploy to a production system. And there are some uh, tricks and uh, to uh, trying to do some of those things, but it's it's not something that's inherently part of our, our platform. Um, that's something that uh, is not as easy for us. If we look at the flip side on strengths, uh, I think the one that uh, is often most shocking uh, when I introduce uh, developers from other platforms to some of FileMaker's strengths is our ability to just rename anything anytime and, and you just refactored it, you're done. Like there is no chasing down all the places that uh, that a table was mentioned or a field name was mentioned and having to uh, to replace all those references as long as you're using references, right? I, I actually, uh, would, I'm a big proponent of uh, using references and not using indirection uh, because I think refactoring is such a user train file maker and you give up some of that if you start using indirection. Uh, so it's definitely something to, uh, to think about. Uh, those are the things that we get that other platforms don't have, like uh, formatted text and fields, uh, which often gets in the way, but it is, it is a feature that's uh, unique to FileMaker. Uh, I actually think uh, live development is a big win for FileMaker, our ability to sort of uh, jump into a system uh, and change it right away uh, without necessarily having to make a trip uh, through a bunch of uh, uh, deployment processes can be a huge advantage uh, for FileMaker. And so understanding the risk or how to do that as safe as possible um, can be a big strength. Uh, and also uh, FileMaker's ability to do containers uh, and, and especially automatic thumbnails and things like that. There's a lot of under, under the hood stuff that happens with containers that is actually really cool um, that we get for free often. We don't even realize it's happening. All right, we're going to keep moving here. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is sort of how we structure our files. Um, and uh, so uh, the simplest setup uh, that uh, people are going to do in FileMaker is a single file solution, right? So uh, I tried to list sort of all the major topic areas that you might see in a solution that would all be encapsulated in a single file here. Um, and there's a bunch of benefits with this. I mean, it's very simple. If you need to give the file to someone, it's like, here, here's your file. Uh, the data, the program, the interfaces are all right in there. Um, the next thing I'm going to jump over to here is uh, this idea of the separation model. And I don't know who to credit. I mean, I mean, the separation model has been around for a long time, but there's probably somebody's name that's most stuck to it. Um, uh, so the idea with the separation model is to split that single solution file into two, and it's really moving uh, all of the uh, records out of the uh, solution into a separate data file. Um, and uh, if you're doing account management, then that's going to need to move down in there too. Uh, sometimes people uh, find it necessary to manage accounts in both files. I'm actually kind of a fan of 
just managing accounts where the user data is, if possible. Um, and one of the big reasons that uh, this approach is used is for uh, being able to run development and production uh, environments. And so the idea here is that you can uh, make enhancements uh, on a separate host uh, in development. And then uh, once you've tested and you're ready to go, you can uh, re essentially just drop in, uh, close the file, drop in the new uh, solution file, and then uh, open it again. And then you leave, uh, you leave the live data there in place. Um, is anybody, uh, this, this is their favorite way to do solutions? No hands are raised in here. <laughs> oh, one. Okay. Uh, so, what, what, what are the reasons or the problems uh, why you wouldn't prefer to use separation? Why do you give it a th thumbs down? Why would you? Say, I mean, since most people were saying that they don't prefer to use it. Uh, everything's harder. You just gotta... <laughs> everything's harder. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. So uh, the the problem that was really that this model was intended for, maybe now better solved with the data migration tool. Yeah, I totally uh, agree with that. Top of my head, we have definitely ran into bugs that only occur in a separation model environment. Hmm. Interesting. Training yeah. people was a lot harder on the first one. Yeah. So. Uh, so based on your feedback back, you may not like my next slide. So <laughs> this is going. Uh, but yeah, I, I actually personally don't have a lot of experience with the uh, data migration tool, but I love uh, what its intended uh, use is. And I know people are having success with it. So, um, so that's great. Uh, I'm really excited to see tools like that. And I hope we get to see more tools like that. Uh, so uh, this is what I'm gonna make the uh, pitch for uh, today is uh, a three-tier model. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I would love, uh, love to hear feedback on this, but I'll, I'll try to sell you on this as best as I can, and then we'll, uh, we'll see how it goes from there. Uh, uh, so this is really taking that, um, that uh, solution file and splitting it again uh, into a presentation tier and logic tier. And this is actually a common practice across a software development environments. Um, uh, well, actually, this is not M MVC. It's a different model. So MVC is a little bit more triangular. Uh, this is very much a layer cake, uh, you know, top down. And uh, so some of the key things that happen here is that in the logic tier, um, you don't have any user interface. So a human never directly interfaces with the logic tier. Um, and you do uh, a lot of your uh, scripting and automation inside of uh, the logic tier. Um, and uh, so there, uh, the only thing that's sort of a new line item that I added here when I split these is uh, I split reports into presented reports versus delivered reports. So if you have uh, something like a, a weekly uh, or monthly script that needs to send out statements to your customer and it's an automated process, that would be something I would build in the logic tier because there's a, not a human interacting with that process fully automated. So there might be a couple layouts in my logic layer just for those sort of automated reports, but otherwise uh, there's no uh, layouts at all in my logic layer. Uh, and so um, in an example solution, if I was starting out, uh, you know, sort of taking my template files and, and starting on a new project, uh, my user interface file would be whatever the code name uh, for the project is, in this case, Donner. And then uh, uh, the convention that I've used with other developers in the past, we use the name wingman for our logic uh, file, and then that file will be hidden. So uh, end users actually never see the file. Uh, it's not presented on the, the shared files and that we never open the window. And then uh, table storage uh, for, the third, for the third layer down. And uh, another important thing with this is that um, we don't create any references going upward. So that's the big difference between MVC. Um, so all of our file references point down or laterally. Uh, and uh, so uh, Donner would have references to wingman and table storage. Wingman would have a reference to table storage. Wingman knows nothing about the user interface file. There's no references to it. 
Um, and uh, there's some big uh, benefits for iterative uh, improvement uh, that you get from that. So I'm going to slide over this uh, logic layer, spread it out, and we can see how things start, start to stack in. So the three-tier architecture does not necessarily mean three files. It means that you've, you've logically grouped your solution into three tiers. Um, so this means you can do things like deploy a lightweight mobile app um, on top of your business logic. Uh, and it can be a dedicated file and it can have a leaner set of interfaces, different themes, different scripts. Um, and it can share all the same sort of uh, core business capabilities um, that are in your logic tier. Uh, at the same time, uh, you might get into a place where you have a lot of data and you have reasons that you want to split that up into multiple data files. Um, so you can start partitioning your data. Um, the, the first place I see people do this is if they have a log file uh, and they, the log file is growing all the time and they just want to separate it from their persistent data that's more important. Um, and, uh, but this could also be uh, departmental uh, containerization. There, there are some, uh, there are a few performance drawbacks to doing this. Uh, FileMaker has some optimizations. If you, if you have unstored calculations that reference tables in the same file, FileMaker will optimize some of your searches. Uh, whereas if you reach across data files and run the same search, uh, the server will punt in a few of those situations and ask the client to do the work. So there are a few times. Uh, we're splitting these might actually make things a little bit slower for you. Uh, one of the big reasons to do it, I think, is if you have a lot of data, the time to recover from a disaster is uh, significantly reduced if you have several smaller files versus one giant data file. Uh, if you need to recover from a backup, if you need to run a consistency check, if you need to do recovery, hopefully not, but if you do, um, you can actually farm out uh, one or more files that need recovery to, to different copies of FileMaker and then bring them back. Uh, if you have a giant file, since that recovery process is single threaded, uh, you know, the amount of time that you're waiting for is sort of proportional to how much data you have. Uh, there's other things that you could start strapping on here. Uh, one of the things that uh, we do a lot are sort of uh, like web portals into our business solution where we need to expose an interface um, to some sort of uh, website or something like that. And uh, we'll actually deploy a separate logic file that's it's kind of almost like a, our proxy or firewall into our business script. So it gives us a chance to run, um, check for an API key or, uh, or run extra validation on the data if, if we really don't trust where the data is coming from, things like that. We want to scrub the data even more. Um, and so that would be a lateral reference into the logic tier or into the data. Uh, uh, one of the other things that's kind of at the logic tier, it's not really a FileMaker file, but uh, any, uh, any server schedules that I have would call directly into the logic tier. They would never open the, the user interface. Um, so, um, and the other thing that is a huge win here is you never have to fight with disabling triggers ever again, because triggers don't exist in a business uh, logic tier. Uh, those triggers are something that you do at the user interface level. And so uh, doing perform script on server or server schedules becomes much easier um, when there's no interface involved. Uh, and then uh, there's a few cases where we have um, uh, self-contained modules, things that are kind of just uh, pre-built uh, components. And one of these uh, we use that uh, is on the Scale FM website often is a sequence generator, and it's a, a module for creating like invoice and customer numbers, things like that. And so it actually just stands as its own file, and it, it doesn't have an interface that anyone uh, uh, works with, other than I guess the the developer when they set it up. So I just listed out some of the some bullets here of some of the the benefits. And most of these I've already covered uh, already. So uh, the slide is here mostly just for reference. So I'm going to jump out. Uh, I was going to unmere, but I think that might be a bad idea with Zoom. So we'll or switch mirror. Anyway, let's do. Let's try just dragging it over here. 
so I was just going to open up um, some uh, sample files that are uh, modeled after um, that layered model, and we can just uh, look at them just a little bit. So uh, one of the other things I didn't put on, on my slide is we'll often create a sandbox file that's sort of like a Probably the closest thing would be like an opener file, but just for the developers. Uh, it's a place that we can just dump garbage. Uh, if we need a debug layout or we need a layout where we can see a bunch of fields or portal or do a, a one-time import or something like that, uh, we'll actually do that in the sandbox. Uh, and uh, part of it is so that you can kind of uh, not clutter up the solution. But the other huge reason is uh, for running DDRs, we never include the sandbox in our DDR export. So if we want to know if something is referenced, we don't care if the sandbox references it. Hello. That's not really a production tool. Um, so uh, yeah. Uh, the other thing we'll do that's uh, kind of helpful, especially for people to get oriented, is uh, a little sort of uh, opener um, uh, navigation for the developer to get the files open, especially since they're hidden. So you can't just open them uh, directly off the server. So they're just buttons to open the, the files at the different layers. Uh, so I'm gonna jump in here and I'm gonna put these uh, sample files up if you wanna download them later, I'll uh, post the link. Feel free to, uh, to borrow and steal. Uh, that's sort of the intended purpose with the sample files. Chris, we have a comment there. Like yeah, go for it. You can see the chat from the uh, Jason put that up. Was talking about uh, advantages of data for file partitioning uh, regarding FileMaker servers and writes concurrency uh, concurrently to multiple files. Um, and then he also said you can improve backup performance, possibly reduce data storage requirements for backups due to hard links in some files that are stacked. Yeah, so if you're online, you should read those comments because those are all some good. Uh, some good inputs on benefits. Uh, there's definitely, uh, there are some other benefits. Uh, uh, I've talked a little bit uh, in some previous presentations on this idea of uh, uh, vertical partitioning. Like sometimes we'll even cut up our tables into multiple tables, uh, but separating out the files, especially if you have data that's, um, that's uh, has a lot of turnover versus things that are more like uh, for posterity or archives, especially if you're like snapshotting data at the quarter or end of year, things like that. If you moved all that data into uh, a separate file, then if the file's not being modified at backup time, it's free. Uh, FileMaker keeps track of files that haven't been changed since the last backup. Um, so you might be able to uh, improve the amount of time uh, that it takes for running backups. But yeah, I think there's several, there are several benefits to uh, partitioning, but there's definitely a management downside and there's a performance, uh, a little bit of a performance trade-off if you need to query something that's um, across files, right? Uh, especially if you have a criteria from one file and another file, you're definitely going to be uh, asking more data to be downloaded from the server to the client. Um, and especially for a WAN situation, that could be problematic. Maybe you can make up for that by using perform script on server and then you could mitigate that. So uh, I just have a little thing here. I'm going to open up and and try to jump through the debugger. So I got to spin around here so I can see. So uh, our convention is a, a custom function called property list, uh, but I also really like the six fried fried rice. Uh, I work on solutions that use JSON too, but uh, our approach uses this. Uh, this pound notation to, to encode our uh, multiple parameters. And so uh, we, do, we use list combined with, uh, with pound to encode these. Oh, I see a typo in my parameter. Let's try a different button. Oh man, <laughs> is this one better? Yes. Okay, so anyway, we have a, I actually never hit the new script button ever. Like we have a template script in every file. We actually have a few template scripts depending on the type of work. So a lot of this uh, boilerplate comments and everything we kind of get for free, but we document what we expect as script parameters and, and uh, we have standardized script results um, that every script returns. 
and uh, we use the single iteration loop uh, model to, uh, to, to handle errors and breaking out of those. Uh, and so here I've just uh, gone from, where'd it go? Sorry. Uh, here I've gone from uh, the user interface layer uh, down into my wingman file and now I'm executing um, uh, a script in my uh, logic layer. And so I've passed down the criteria. I, this script is supposed to get the total number of orders or total quantity of orders uh, for a certain country. And uh, so I initialize a bunch of counters and things like that. Uh, and I use, uh, you could use execute SQL in here, but I prefer most of the time to use uh, FileMaker's um, sort of native uh, go to layout, enter find mode, find the thing. Yeah. Yeah. In well, sometimes, almost. We'll yeah, we'll say most. We'll say. <laughs> uh, so here I'm just doing a find, and then, uh, and I have some error checking here. It turns out that uh, somebody truncated my table, so there's uh, no records that match. Uh, but if they had matched, um, I like I love using the list of uh, IDs, like it's part of my table template. So every table has a list of IDs, almost every table. So if I ever need to get a, a, a collection of the found set, I can just collect all the IDs right into a, a variable. And then- do you, uh, Chris, do you use an unstored? I would loop through those and actually call across inside of the logic layer to a, a sub-module. So I'm doing separation of concerns to a, a, a tighter component of this job. Um, and then I would uh, accumulate those things and variables, and then set my script result. In this case, I'm going to have an error that I bubble up. And uh, so then, since I'm not allowed to show dialog boxes or card windows or anything in my logic layer, because there's no guarantee that I have a human attached uh, when I'm running a script in the logic layer. Uh, so I build a script result that has my error code uh, and a message if I've set one. And so when we exit, get past that boilerplate code, uh, then I see that the script had an error. I'm going to handle it, so I'm going to break out of my single iteration loop. Instead of displaying the results of my report, uh, I have a, an error handling section down here that's going to show the error to the uh, user, which came up on my other screen. Um, so the idea here is that, uh, you know, Lots of the scripts in the user interface layer are actually really short. It's just sort of like collecting data off the portal row or the state of the window, uh, calling down to a reusable sort of business module, um, and then sending those results back to the user interface layer. Uh, so there's there's more code. You now there's separation of concerns. There's extra code to encode that stuff, pass it down, set up the context again. Another place where there's some repeated code is in the the relationship graph because I have to have uh, relationships to find uh, down there that might be redundant with the user interface layer. Uh, but uh, an advantage is this module that I just wrote, now I can call it from a perform script on server. I could call it from a server schedule. I could call it from a PHP web portal. They could all reuse that same function. Uh, and I don't have to worry about uh, how the triggers or interfaces might uh, be behaving in, down there because there are not. Is there a reason you don't use JSON to pass your parameters? Uh, the, re the question was, is there a reason I don't use JSON to pass my parameters? And I think the answer is because there's not a reason to use JSON to pass my parameters. Yeah, actually, I do work on solutions where we uh, use J uh, JSON exclusively. Um, my biggest hang up with not just wholesale moving over all, all the time is um, the amount of code you have to write to safely encode and decode JSON is more than my uh, suite of custom functions that I have as far as uh, uh, with the exception of nesting, if you have to nest data in a deep structure, JSON definitely wins there. Uh, it's better for that. Uh, and uh, on performance, 
uh, I still need to run some performance comparisons with, with uh, JSON, but I think in some cases, six fried rice is actually gonna be faster, uh, their encoding method. Uh, but uh, the six fried rice functions are, they're magic. I, uh, it is hard to make anything faster than the way they- The where they're declaring the variables? No, they uh, do really fancy substitution, really fancy substitution. Um, and uh, so there's no recursion and there's no evaluate either. Uh, whereas the let approach uh, requires you to evaluate the data coming in, which is a little bit of a risk if you have anyone calling in from, uh, from outside. So although there are some ways to work around and protect that. But. So, so, so given you're, you're an expert in how you're structuring your files here, Hey, when you were first learning or for someone new that's teaching, how much longer overhead did it take to, to write things when you're doing it with the extra files, next to scripts, next to PO, next to layouts? And yeah, the question is, uh, you know, how much extra learning curve is there um, with the extra layers? Uh, and that's definitely something to train. Uh, there's more training involved. Um, you know, the big the big trigger for us of why we got into this approach is because we had multiple developers. Uh, we did that. We were working in-house. We had uh, like two and a half full-time developers working nine to five on the same solution. Uh, and so we really needed to develop tools that would allow us to be able to divide and conquer problems and, um, and uh, deal with a fairly larger scale solution. So I think that there is an argument sometimes, especially in smaller solutions, like why make the investment for this extra architecture? Um, and I think the best answer is, do you hope your business is gonna be successful and be 10 times or 100 times bigger, uh, you know, 10 years from now uh, without having to start over? Um, so I think that there's, there's, uh, there's definitely some investment up front, but there are definitely returns later on as the solution scales um, and you have more code to maintain, uh, more things to test. Uh, there's definitely some advantages. And actually a lot of my solutions, I'll end up writing uh, one module at a time and then there'll be a test script right next to it. So I just test the module and you can do that in a single file too. Um, but sometimes it's easier to solve the problem of how to, how, to, uh, how am I gonna solve this business problem Okay, now I've solved the business problem. Now, how am I gonna present it to the user? So lots of times I would still prefer to solve those problems separately anyway. And then I'm not really doing that much more work to have it in two separate files. Uh, so, and the graph part, um, there is extra relationship graph, but I actually, um, I don't feel the pain from that anymore. I, I feel like it's so fast to add TOs, especially if you have good naming conventions and things like that. If you realize you need something that's not there, you just tack it on and, and move on. Uh, so I don't feel a lot of resistance on the graph side. Chris, do you want to comment on your sequence generator and how that came to be? Uh, Stephen asked if I wanted to comment on sequence generator. And I think I may come back to that if time allows. <laughs> I go to Scale FM and look at the sequence generator. I think it's it's well described there, but it's basically a, a solution for um, for issuing human readable numbers if you're going to adopt UUIDs on a full scale. Uh, so it uh, compartmentalizes the task of creating customer numbers, uh, invoice numbers into a reusable module. And that was one of the other things we took on as a larger team. We wanted to be able to develop during business hours. Uh, and in order to uh, get around some of the tricky barriers with live development, UIDs is a big win there. Uh, and if there's, I don't think there's gonna be time. So have me come back again in six months or something and we'll talk about that. Uh, we could spend a whole night just talking about uh, live development uh, pitfalls and, and ways to, to work around that. Uh, so the next thing I wanted to uh, make sure I covered, it, which is a huge thing, uh, if you can uh, get a handle on some of this, um, it can be a huge win for performance. And uh, can you see, you can't see my pointer up here. Okay, well, anyway, I've got a find here that uh, sets two criteria. So this was from our weir a real, world, real world system. And... Um, so we had an invoice table with our header records and invoice item table. 
And this script was supposed to find um, uh, how many units did we ship of a given product uh, over all time. And so we wanted to find all the invoice items with that product ID, but then we wanted to omit like our voided invoices and uh, uh, unshipped invoices, things that, uh, or pending invoices. We only want to see the ones that actually shipped. So we, then we had a criteria that was in our header level um, that we only wanted to see shipped uh, records as part of our find. And uh, this find was, um, if you did a find on either one of the criteria by themselves on a layout that was based on that, they would be almost, almost instantaneous. Um, but if you combine the criteria, now we've got like a 35 second find. Um, and that was for a client on a gigabit LAN, you know, sitting next to the server. This would be, um, you know, could be compounded by lots of other issues too. You know, uh, understanding cardinality is a big help for uh, understanding why that is so slow and what you can do about it. Um, so when you uh, have fields that are indexed, there's this, uh, there's this concept of cardinality of basically uh, what's the ratio of uniqueness between unique values and the number of records that are associated to each of those values. So your primary key has the highest cardinality. So every primary key that you assign, in this case, there case there are serial numbers, is associated to one internal record ID in FileMaker. So when you do a search for primary key 4568, uh, it looks in the index, it sees that there's one record uh, behind that uh, index value and it's gonna be able to go uh, return that record to the client and then the client can put it up on the screen. Um, so that's a high cardinality case. Uh, if we move uh, down the spectrum a little bit to medium cardinality, this would be uh, values that are, uh, have some uniqueness, but some overlap. So uh, a name like Knowles might not have very many records in your database, uh, but a name like Smith might have lots of, lots of records that match, right? So this is sort of a field of where the index would have medium, or we'd say medium cardinality. And then at the far end of the spectrum would be low cardinality. Um, so like how many of your invoices over the last 10 years are paid? Hopefully, a a lot of, hopefully a lot, high percentage of them, right? Um, so this is a situation where uh, uh, there's only two values in the, uh, the index and there might be millions of records that each of those two index entries point to. And it might be completely lopsided where one of them has almost all the records behind it, like our situation with shipped, uh, with shipped orders. Uh, so uh, uh, I looked for an easy way to make a Venn diagram here. So I'll hold my hands up and no one can see that's on Zoom. But if you picture a, a Venn diagram where you've got uh, in one circle, you've got uh, all your records, uh, invoices for a certain product that you shipped. Uh, so maybe there's like 5,000 records inside of that circle. And then you've got another circle that has all of your, uh, you know, shipped or paid invoices. And there might be, you know, 5 million dots in that circle. Um, if you're asking FileMaker, like, hey, I'm in invoices, how many records are in this circle? It actually answers that question really fast, even if it's a large set. But as soon as you go to overlap those two things, now you're asking FileMaker to um, take this small set of things and take this massive set of things and collate and sort through and tell me where they overlap. And it's actually a really big, uh, a really big job. And uh, some database platforms, uh, have optimizations to try to try to help with that problem, which sometimes work, sometimes don't work. Um, but uh, the solution, I'm, I'm just gonna go back to the, the code here, uh, is really to take out the criteria that has um, low cardinality. So to solve the problem with this script, uh, we take out the shipped, shipped criteria. So now the find executes in like, 0.01 seconds, right? And we return back like 5,000 records, which are in the, the circle with the smaller number of dots. And then we just run a loop. Uh, so this loop that's already looping over the records down here to accumulate quantity, we just add an if condition to say, if it's shipped, count it. If it's not shipped, don't count it. So we have to travel past, you know, maybe there's a 1% waste or something where we're having to skip past records that essentially we're manually omitting. So instead of asking FileMaker to omit them, we're gonna omit them in a loop. 
Um, and then uh, the performance has an opportunity to be hugely improved, like going from like 30 seconds to like 0.3 seconds. Uh, you could easily see a 10x or even 100x performance improvement, especially if you take advantage of perform script on server. Uh, so that that loop, when it's having to, you know, traverse all those records, fetch them out of the database and count them up. If you're doing that on the servers, you've eliminated any sort of, uh, you know, physical distance between the, the script and the database. Um, then FileMaker can actually burn through those records really fast. Um, so uh, I wouldn't hesitate to loop and accumulate across 5,000, even 10,000 records if it means that I can avoid uh, a low, cardin low cardinality constraint that's not on my table occurrence. If it's far away, uh, it's really gonna hurt. And that the workaround, uh, the solution for that is to, to not ask FileMaker to do that fine and just uh, handle, handle omitting those records as you work through them. Um, and actually when uh, I get asked to help people with solutions that have grown, scaled, and one of their challenges is performance, um, they have a script that used to work great and we don't know why, but like our statements take a long time to run now or whatever. Uh, a high percentage of the time, probably the number one factor is something like this, where this script performed great when they had uh, a thousand invoices or even 10,000 invoices. But now that they have, you know, 100,000 invoices, it's really starting to hurt because uh, uh, when the script was first test built and tested, they didn't have that scale of test data to, to work with. It's hard to reproduce some of those things and, ex and see them coming. Uh, so anyway, um, understanding that idea of cardinality, um, thinking about the data you're querying and, and how likely is it that that phrase is gonna return a ton of records through a relationship um, is something to definitely watch for. So I think I've run just about an hour here. So I'm, I'm gonna call it good. Well, I, I don't have another demo, but the, I guess the last thing I'll mention on that question that Steven mentioned about sequence generator, um, the reason we built that was uh, for live development. Um, we did a bunch of testing because uh, uh, we wanted to do more live de development, but we heard from our users when there was a beach ball uh, that they had a problem with it. And so we we're trying to figure out exactly what causes those situations. Uh, one of the things that we found is that um, getting into managed database was a problem during business hours. Uh, it could cause problems for our users. And um, specifically, if you go into managed database and you go to your table definition and you double click on a field to bring up the options window, the second you bring up the options window, the client is downloading from the server all of the metadata for all the setup for all those fields. Um, and if any of the fields in that table, regardless of which one you opened the window for, has an auto increment field, it takes out a lock on the table and no users can create records until you dismiss the managed uh, database box. And uh, there's a good reason for that. If you had that window showing that said the next ID is gonna be 4278 and you took a break, you came back an hour later and saved, now you've got hundreds of records with overlapping IDs, right? So the solution to that is to keep people from assigning IDs. That's, that's why it exists. Um, so it turns out if you get rid of, um, in our experience, if you get rid of all your auto increment fields out of all your tables, um, you can open managed database during business hours and you can eliminate 99% of the beach balls um, that the users experience. Uh, so that was a huge win for us. Uh, so we sent a team policy that we would be willing to open managed database during business hours. You could go in there, you could look around, you could add TOs. Uh, the only thing that we said was off limits was adding fields until after business hours because, uh, or modifying a field definition that might cause FileMaker to have to update all the records in that table. That could be expensive and people could be frozen up. So we- yeah, once you open those field options, that's, that's yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, sequence, so then the, uh, the uh, problem was, well, you know, we're not going to convince our 
customer service manager that it's okay to read a UUID, you know, customer account number over the phone. Uh, we still are going to need human readable IDs for those things. And uh, we actually had a formal, former uh, Oracle DBA on our team, and he gave us a bunch of advice on, on how to uh, programmatically create sequences. And so we, we built a module called Sequence Generator. We basically had a file that was responsible for that. Uh, so we handled that in that file. And that, that's definitely off limits during any time any users are connected as far as redefining it. But then we could kind of have a heyday in our uh, solution files uh, because we would never run into those uh, serial number situations. So um, it's not right all of the time, but that, that was the motivation behind it. And it was a big win. Um, and uh, I still use it in quite a few solutions today. Um, and we added more and more features to sequence generator so it can actually create more complicated sequences than you can do in, uh, in uh, the field definitions. So we kind of kept the idea going and, and went a little farther with it. The, the big drawback with sequence generator is you can't create a record without a script. Um, so if you're in a sort of a, a easy starter, you know, beginner solutions where people are just making records through portals and things like that, it's not a solution for you. But if you're controlling uh, record creation and you're already writing scripts to do it, then it's not a it's not a big stretch to use a sequence generator. That's it. Unless there's any uh, questions, did anything else come in on the Zoom that we can answer? Or? Let me unmute here. <clears throat> I don't think we have any. We've had some nice conversation in chat. Thank you all for sharing all these wonderful tips and other DevCon. Uh, sessions. I just threw one in there as well about live uh, files. Let me read this latest one. Okay. I guess we'll wrap it up here, but thank you all. Uh, Chris, thank you so much and everybody for making your journey uh, here and for all you attended out there. Uh, we look forward to seeing you one day in person soon. Um, and we'll post this up on uh, YouTube for everybody to share with others and uh, uh, revisit whenever you need. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Take care.